Celebrating 44 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on a Farm Week feature show, we start with a story on agritourism, a family favorite in more ways than one. In Southern Gardening, now that Christmas is over, Gary's got a poinsettia revival. Plus the rest of the story on a bacteria that might be making a comeback. Some folks are concerned. And the conclusion of our behind the scenes story on Bull Bottom Farms. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Happy New Year and thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. We've got an interesting show lined up for you and we're going to start with a fun little story about agritourism, a place called Bull Bottom Farms in Duck Hill, Mississippi, west of Starkville, about 75 miles. Agritourism is a growing part of the state's economy and this operation started with an idea. We were young, just starting to have kids, and we we're like, hey, you know, we gotta make this make a living for us, you know? It's not just, let's go have some fun. Just kind of brainstorming and um, looking around online and trying to figure out ways that you can increase income on a farm, and ag tourism was something that popped up, and I thought, we could do that. I know we could do that. people from all over come and they love it you know and it just makes us feel good to be able to provide something like this the parents are excited about being here you can tell that they love seeing their kids so excited it's been more than what we ever expected it to be you know we run into a family and just ask them how they you know where they come from and if they're enjoying it and they're like, well, would somebody come from this area and another one came from this and we just met here and just spent the day together. You know, that's, that's what we wanted to make happen out here. We have the little kids come out here four or five years old. Well, they bring their aunts and uncles and, you know, it's just a, it's a family thing. You come out here and, and just, you get to be a kid again. It's so special and sweet to see parents out here playing, pushing them on a swing. Yeah, it's special, it really is. My father bought this place back in 1943. Uh, bought it from a guy named Jim Bull, and that's where we get the Bull Bottom. And I started farming right out of high school and have now been farming since 1975. So it's about 45 years. We went to high school at Grenada Lake Academy and she was the prettiest little girl there. So <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> After we had the kids and all, we, uh, I used to go to the field and you know take lunch and all with the kids and stuff because I, I didn't work. I stayed at home, of course, four kids. And, uh, we, but we used to go to the farm, to the field where they was working and picnic, you know. <laughs> well, they was raised on the farm, but uh, none of them really were that interested in farming. And uh, Yeah, I mean, I grew up farming with them and helping and all of that and was getting ready to go to college and, and thought, okay, when I get, get through with college, that's the last thing I'm gonna do is farm. And I tried to get him involved in farming and he farmed for a year and uh, got to meet Katie. And once he met Katie, it was pretty much the end of him in the farming. Nick and I met um, when I was a senior in high school and um, we started dating and just have been together ever since. That was in 1999. But she had no idea about farming. I used to get her out here whenever we was dating in college and stuff and I'd get her on a tractor and you know everybody thinks they're so difficult to drive so I'd get her on there and have her disc in a field or something and I'd get off and I'd go get on another tractor so we could get through and get through early and uh, her dad's like you don't need to let her drive one of those tractors now. <laughs> Looking back now he was just flirting with me I know that but it was fun though I mean really fun and I got to know his family and um, just fell in love with them and 
my parents said, you're going to college. We don't care where you go, but you're going. So I chose Ole Miss and um, he was already farming with his dad and going to school at that time. And he decided he might want a career change. So he came on to Ole Miss too. So we were both there. We graduated from Ole Miss on the same day. And they moved to Suffolk, Virginia. He wanted to get as far away from his farm as he could. Virginia was a little far from home. So Nashville and we enjoyed it, and, but we was getting ready to have kids and that's when it was like, okay, we want to be close to family. I had uh, previously been working a job and with the economy being what it was in 2008, I was laid off and uh, I talked with my county agent to see what we could do here at the farm to generate some income. And we had decided that we really wanted to get back home. And Nick had done row crop with his dad before, and so we knew that the way that the row crop stood, that it wasn't gonna support two families. And he said, have you ever thought about ag tourism? I said, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. We just started doing a lot of research and checking out other farms that already did it. She got out and was like, had pictures of, you know, eight school buses in the parking lot, you know, this is all in, Tennessee, outside of Nashville, you know, plenty of populated area, and um, she was saying, "We, well, I think we could do it down there, and you know, I was like, I don't know, that's in Duck Hill, I don't know about that, you know. When we put our heads together, we just decided, we're going we're gonna to try this. When I made the decision to try and do this, I was telling my wife, Vicki, I said, uh, I think I'm going to do this, Vicki. She said, Earl, you have no idea what you're getting into. And she was exactly right. I had no idea that this thing was going to do as well. And I thought it's going to be a lot of cleaning up to do back there because it, it had been a farming place, you know, since Earl was born. So I just knew we had a lot of cleaning up. And I said, you know, we, we got a lot of work to do if that's what y'all want to do. And I was skeptical about it. I felt like it's more work than we were going to be able to do. Whenever he got ready to start doing it one summer, we were like, okay, let's plan to move back and help him with this. And we, it took us a year to get moved back. The first year we drove from Nashville to Grenada every weekend, um, four, four and a half hour drive every weekend after working all week on the road because we were both in outside sales at the time. But, um, but I mean, it was totally worth it. We knew after the first time we came and did it, we were like, this is it. Cute story. So what happened next? How did the agritourism side of Bull Bottom Farms actually get off the ground? Well, stick around. We'll have the rest of that story later in the show. But trust me, Katie Robinson's idea of how to blossom the operation turned out to be a good one. A great southern gardening story now before we get too far past the holidays. If you're like me, you've wondered if you can somehow preserve this Christmas beauty and <laughs> save it for next year. Well, with a little TLC before you need an SOS or it just goes DOA, it's a definite possibility. Here's Gary with the DIY. Many of us had a beautiful poinsettia for the Christmas holidays. These gorgeous plants can certainly brighten a dreary weather-wise part of the year. Now what? Do you keep it or toss it? Let me share some tips for enjoying your poinsettia year-round. First, put your poinsettia in a warm, sunny window and water normally. As far as temperature is concerned, if you're comfortable, your poinsettia will be too. Temperatures below 60 degrees can cause leaf drop. Remember, these are tropical plants native to Mexico. In spring, start decreasing watering and allow to dry out a bit. Cut the stems back to about four inches, don't worry, it will grow back, and repot into a bigger container. When night temps stay above 60 degrees, move outside. The poinsettia will love your porch or patio. Remember to water and fertilize as needed. Prune the stems back one to two inches a couple of times during the summer to promote bushier growth. When night temperatures start hitting 60 in the fall, bring the plant back inside. Now comes the fun part. Can you make your poinsettia bloom for Christmas? 
Beginning October 1st, use a box to cover and keep your plant in total darkness for 14 continuous hours every day for at least six weeks. There's no guarantee, but hopefully it will be ready for Christmas. If not, I will guarantee there'll be plenty of colorful poinsettias to pick up at your local garden center to enjoy. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our final Farm Week feature, the conclusion of our story about Bull Bottom Farms. The farmland has belonged to the Robinson family since the early 40s, but all these years later, a new idea for how to work the farm and make it both profitable and appealing to the public is growing in the hearts and minds of the Robinsons. It's an idea called agritourism. The rest of the story coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Never carry more than one person on a single rider four-wheeler. The four-wheeler can become unstable and very dangerous. ATVs are designed for off-road use only. Never drive one on a highway or any other paved surface. And always ride the right size machine at the right speed. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. It's a simple idea. Knowledge that transforms lives shouldn't be limited to those on a campus, but extended to any and all who want or need it, wherever they are. At Mississippi State University, we've been making that possible for more than 100 years through the MSU Extension Service. What began as an effort to extend the latest research to farmers has become something much more. Today, we're helping Mississippians from all walks of life, giving them the tools they need to build a brighter future. We're sparking the imagination of students around the state and inspiring the next generation of doctors. We're helping rural communities find their way to the internet and connect to the world at large. And we're teaching families how to lead healthier lives in ways both big and small. MSU is standing firm in its commitment to that one simple idea. Extend the knowledge that transforms lives wherever they are. Next up, an extended version of a shorter news story we brought you three weeks ago. It's about a bacteria called brucellosis that most experts thought had been virtually eradicated long ago. Some are concerned that it may be making a comeback of sorts. Colleen Bradford Krantz has the whole story. The near eradication of brucellosis, a costly bacterial disease that affected a large number of U.S. cattle herds in the early part of the last century, is one of the nation's major livestock and public health triumphs. It was very prevalent in, in 1934 when our brucellosis program began. Maybe they figured maybe 50% of the herds were infected. Um, the program began, they started testing for the disease, removing those animals that were infected. By 1957, they reckoned about 13% of the herds were infected in the United States, like 234,000 herds. And then in the early 40s, they developed the vaccine. In 2008, for the first time, they, there were no infected herds in the United States. Experts worry, however, that infected wildlife, particularly elk and bison in the Yellowstone National Park area, are slowly reversing some of that progress in cattle. The disease can cause cows to abort their calves and have milk production fall off dramatically. There is additional concern that another strain of brucella bacteria that particularly affects hogs is being spread by wild boar in the southern United States. Now, since 2008, of course, we've had a number of, of herds that have been infected, but they've been infected by, by wildlife. Back in the 30s, it was people buying cattle that were infected, and those cattle infected their cattle. That's all gone, but now it's wildlife coming into 
farmyards and ranches and aborting and passing the disease to cattle. Dr. Clark, one of USDA Veterinary Service's top experts on brucellosis, says livestock will sniff or lick the aborted materials and easily become infected with the resilient bacteria. Brucella, the bacteria that causes the disease, can also be passed to humans, often through unpasteurized milk, and causes fevers and other symptoms that, left untreated, can become chronic. With brucella, which cost the livestock industry about $400 million annually in the mid-1900s, now nearly eliminated from U.S. pastures and feedlots, human infections have also fallen. They've proven in a number of countries that if you can control it in animals, it's controlled in humans also. Because the vaccine currently used on cattle and bison isn't as effective on wildlife like elk, scientists are working on a new version. There's one problem. Several types of brucella bacteria are included on the federal government's list of possible biological terrorism agents. As a result, the bacteria falls under strict regulatory controls, limiting study to the nation's most secure scientific laboratories, like the National Animal Disease Center in Ames, Iowa. That meant bio-level three containment for both laboratory and animal work, and that's expensive and most most places do not have that capability. And so for that reason, then you saw the number of, of uh, laboratories and scientists actually working in the large animal hosts go down. Recently, some USDA officials have agreed with animal scientists that it may be time to consider removing the disease from that list so researchers can work outside the lab. At a minimum, they hope research will be allowed near Yellowstone. It's still kind of a work in progress as I understand it. The agent is already running loose in those pop wild populations out there, so you're not introducing anything into that environment that's not already there. Dr. Olson points out that even with an effective vaccine for wildlife, finding a way to administer it to free-ranging animals such as elk would be problematic. In Montana, state veterinarian Dr. Marty Zalewski, who has seen area cattle producers have to deal with the return of the disease, has been encouraging federal officials to move ahead with a policy change. If approved, two types of brucella bacteria could be removed from the select agents list. National security officials, however, are still weighing the pros and cons. There is a fairly long history of nations wanting to weaponize brucellosis um, and use it as a bioterrorist weapon. Uh, I believe that certainly the, U the USSR, the prior, pr prior Russia, had a program. I believe this country looked at it as well. This might be one form of biological warfare. I believe that historical record is really, really the primary reason why this agent was included in this, in this list. But I would argue that that's actually, a, it's, it's, you know, it's misplaced. Zalewski says treatment and prevention of the disease has come a long way. If you're a terrorist and you choose your weapon of choice for Bruce, as Brucella abortus, you're not the brightest crayon in the box. This disease is, we have a ready test for this disease. The incubation period, so the time from exposure until illness can be several weeks. Um, we have a, a very inexpensive and effective treatment for this disease. Contrast this type of an agent to Ebola or anthrax. It just doesn't make sense to me. Zalewski worries that federal officials could, in trying to protect human health by keeping brucella on the list, inadvertently increase human cases by not allowing the scientific community a simpler way to study brucellosis and wildlife. My concern is that without interventions that are effective, brucellosis is going to spread throughout the entire contiguous range of elk in the Rockies and the Northwest. You know, based on a map that I saw from the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, that includes anywhere between 10 to 12 states. And so I don't know whether that's gonna happen in 20 years, 30 or 40 years, but I think the outcome, if we don't develop better tools, is somewhat bleak. 
Back now to the rest of our story on Bull Bottom Farms in Duck Hill, Mississippi, a charming story about agritourism. Katie Robinson, the daughter-in-law of landowner Earl Robinson, has the perfect idea for how to present the farm to the public. From producer Jonathan Parrish, here's that story. I remember calling him one morning and we had already been talking about all this. And I said, Earl, I have thought of what we're gonna put on everything. And he said, what? And I said, we're gonna say Bull Bottom Farms, bringing families together since 1944. And so anyway, he's like, I love it. And I said, cause Earl, that's what it's doing. It's bringing us back together. And I said, and people are gonna be coming out there with their kids and spending family time together. And it's been about family since the get go. One of the things that has uh, really made me proud is I'll see a, a family that lives in Columbus, one in Greenville, one in Hernando, and they meet here for the day. And it's, I, that's what goes on. Kids come out here and let them experience agriculture and you know, let them have fun and just you know, have families together. It's just nice to see the parents bringing the kids and moms and dads and grandparents and, and all, and everybody just loves it and tells us all the time how nice it is and all. And then you see the little ones going home crying after they've been here most all day. And they cry because they do not want to leave. They just want to keep going. Yeah, I love it. She was all in whenever it got to, you know, us moving back and being back home and working with us. And, uh, we all work good together most of the time. The first weekend we opened, we probably didn't have 30 people out here. Uh, the next day on Saturday, we probably had 50 or 60 people out. And on Sunday, it was the same way. The next weekend, she comes out with cowboy boots, new jeans, she's on board, you know. <laughs> you can tell if she went and spent some money to get to looking like a cowgirl, she's ready to go then. Once we started clearing up and had all our ideas in our head and what we were going to do and all, I was excited about it. We all were. This is her backyard. She said from day one, if we're fixing to invite a bunch of people over here, it's going to look good now. We tell her, we say she's the president of the beautification committee. <laughs> you know, the little kids come for the things to play on, but the adults, you know that they the ones that love outdoors and gardening and all like that. So yeah, you want the grounds to be pretty. She and I, we just play off of each other and we both enjoy a lot of the same things. We like to decorate and that kind of stuff. And so that kind of goes hand in hand with making the farm look pretty and um, the gift shop look cute and you know, just all of those kind of things she and I work really good together on. We couldn't do it without her because, I mean, there's much, many phone calls she gets and, you know, handling the booking and reservations and all of that. You know, we'll get a school group out here and I'll be getting them, and I'm like, where y'all, where y'all from? What school is it? And like, I don't have a clue what school it is. Like, she handles all of that. I want every ch group to feel like they're an only child. So when they're here, they know who their group leader is. She knows where she's taking them. We don't like them to run into each other. Uh, when you're at the slide, you're the only class at the slide. As Katie started working, we do school groups during the week, and she, being uh, the age she is, she was able to communicate with the teachers, which were her age. Me and Vicki, we hit the road, and we went to all the schools that we could get to and started just dropping flyers off and just telling them about, you know, hey, tell your teachers to give us a call if they're interested in field trips. and. Turns out there's nowhere to go to a field trip around here, so they all started calling. And I mean, we went and did things together because she's more the business person and she's got the ideas and she knows how to spread the word and you know, and so it was nice when they were back. You know, it's a lot of moms that are bringing their kids, wanting to find something for their family to go do, and so you know, her opinion and you know, ideas of what we ought to do or what we should add or you know, ways to improve it and make it better and make it a better experience for our customers. Like, you know, that's, couldn't ask for anything better. It is hard work and it can be stressful, but it's totally worth it. I mean, if you have a job where you get to be around your kids and your family as much as I do, I mean, you got it made. 
on Saturday morning, when the people are lining up to come in, they're the ones that's gonna take care of all that. I may be in the cotton field picking, uh, but you don't have to worry about it. They're gonna take care of it, you know? And so they are bull bottom farms. We take just as much pride in it as Nick and Earl do, really, even though this is Earl's family's land, and she and I just kind of married into it, you know? But, um, but I mean, now my kids are growing up out here. So, I mean, a piece of my heart is, is going to hopefully be here for the long run. So, uh, yeah, she and I are just as proud of it as they are. Bull Bottom Farms in Duck Hill, Mississippi. Well, next week, an update on the lamb market. Pre-COVID, the industry was geared up for what it thought would be a banner year, but the virus hit, of course, and sales plummeted. On the other hand, thanks to bold moves by producers and with help from the government, the industry looks to open two new processing plants. More than one company was spared bankruptcy. New life in an alternative market, next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next year. Thanks for watching.